Good morning, saints of God. Welcome to the Deep Things of God with Brother Mike. It's my podcast number two. Thanks for tuning in. I'm going to have another interesting Bible study for you today. I hope you watched podcast number one. The purpose of it was to uh, alleviate uh, self-condemnation over sinning based on those uh, words in 1 John, which are very important. He said, he that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. That is a very misinterpreted verse. It does not mean what it says. I explained it in that uh, podcast, and you will find great relief from it. Um, today's Bible study is on human sexuality, and I'm going to caution you. I'll be discussing some very um, personal issues today. and. Uh, Pastors and ministers are going to be a little upset with me, but uh, I'm going to show you exactly what the Word of God says about human sexuality, and then we'll let the chips fall where they may. They could follow my email address, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. Send me an email if you have questions. If you know someone who needs to be delivered or healed, and they can't come to the Deliverance Center, um, Send me an email and I'll send you the miracle list, a step-by-step guide, excuse me, to healing and deliverance that works 100% of the time. And uh, also, if you happen to live in the Phoenix area and you're a born-again Christian, you're eligible for free counseling services at the Deliverance Center. I have an outstanding counseling staff there. I also do counseling uh, appointments, and um, it's quite remarkable. We see people delivered and healed on a routine, regular basis. And if you don't believe me, hey, come see me. Just come and see. It's that easy. All right, let's start into our Bible study today on human sexuality. Now, I need to go over a couple of Greek words with you. Uh, One is apoluo, and the other one is apostasion. And uh, in the New Testament, I'm using the King James Bible. Um, I'm not sure what words, obviously, your version of the Bible says, but it's the same Greek word. In the King James Bible, the terms put away and divorce or divorcement are both used, and it's the same Greek word, uh, apeluo. It means to dismiss, send away, get rid of, uh, go. That's what it means, to get rid of. And the word divorce or divorcement is apostasion. It means a written divorce papers, essentially. You put it in writing. The marriage ends on this date and so on. Here's the provisions. There you go. You're divorced. And this whole idea came from Moses. Deuteronomy 24, Moses laid down the divorce laws for Judaism. And, uh, yeah, it's confusing. Um, Moses said, uh, on your wedding night, after you're married. Um, If the husband finds something about the woman that is displeasing, and the Hebrew word there, and again, I don't know Hebrew. Don't ask me any questions about it. The Hebrew word there apparently means uh, something involving her nudity. People assume it's 100% related to virginity. She was, she was not a virgin. Okay. But I'm not sure of that. It could, it it could be something, um, something wrong with her genitals, uh, something, uh, strange about her body sexually. Um, it doesn't actually spell it out, but anyway, people assumed it was involving her virginity. And uh, whatever it was, 
the, the husband was required by law to give the wife a writing of divorcement and apostasion. There, you're divorced. Now you can go marry another guy. Um, if the family protested it, then there was a Sanhedrin type court hearing, and then the family put on their case that she should stay married. So essentially, the guy's mother and father in law would present evidence that his claims were false. And the main claim was the bed sheets. If the bed sheets had blood on them, uh, the judge would rule in favor of the wife. And then the judge uh, put sanctions on the husband. I don't want to go into all that. But anyway, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had changed the law. It included anything. If the husband uh, didn't like her feet, uh, didn't like her cooking, didn't like, uh, it was ridiculous. They said, uh, well, you can get a divorce. Just give her a apostasion and she's out. Okay. Jesus came along and blasted them. And he dropped a series of spiritual neutron bombs in Matthew chapter 19. It was quite remarkable. Quote, the Pharisees came to Jesus tempting him. Is it lawful to put away your wife, Apoluo? For every cause. Okay, now that's the contents of the question. Jesus said, well, didn't you read about Moses? Didn't you read about Genesis? In the beginning, God made him male and female. For this cause, a man leaves his wife. He joins his wife, and they become one flesh. The Greek word for join or cleave to your wife is proskalao. It means to be glued. You're glued together. Super glue can't can't get it apart. The only thing that's going to split that super glue is the sin of uh, fornication. And then the Pharisees said to him, "Why did Moses give us an out? Then why did he allow us to get divorced?" And Jesus said, "Because of the hardness of your hearts, he allowed you to apeluo." Dismiss, get rid of, shush out the door, your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Then Jesus drops a bomb on us. I say to you, whoever shall put away his wife, apeluo, get rid of, except for fornication, and marries another, commits adultery. So here Jesus says, Essentially, what Moses was say, saying, you have one exception for divorce that makes it legal. It's fornication, Greek word pornea. Now, the Greek word pornea is very interesting because it doesn't mean what people think it means. Now, I'll explain that in a minute. Then Jesus said, if they marry another, they commit adultery. Well, now that doesn't mean what it says either. I'm reading out of the King James Bible. The Greek word pornea means any form of sexual sin. So anything that's sexually sinful could be fornication, uh, gay sex, animal sex, oral sex, massage parlors, strip clubs, pedophilia, bondage sex, Porn, gentlemen's clubs, having an affair, bisexuality, anything. If you name something that's sinfully sexual, that's fornication. Anything. That's a sin. Fornication includes all forms of sin. For example, it's the umbrella of sin. And underneath is one portion of fornication, which is uh, muikia, which is adultery. That's referring to any form of heterosexual sin. So if you have sex with a goat, that is not adultery. That's fornication. We call it bestiality. 
if you have sex with someone that's the same sex as you are, that's called homosexuality. That is not adultery. That is fornication. If you have an office affair with someone of the opposite sex, that is moikia, adultery, heterosexual sex. Uh, if you received or gave oral sex to someone and they're the same sex as you are, that is fornication, not adultery. If they're opposite sex, that would be adultery. Muikia. All right, so in, in this verse, Jesus said, except for fornication, and you can see now that the grounds for divorce have been expanded dramatically. It includes all forms of fornication. So if you come home and you find out your husband or wife has got a sex addiction on the internet and they're addicted to Pornhub, that is adultery and it is grounds for divorce. If you find out they're bi and they're, they're addicted to gay porn, that is not adultery, it's fornication, and grounds for divorce. Then Jesus said, whoever marries her that is put away, apoluo, sent off, got rid of, commits adultery. Now, this same Greek word is used in both, both these verses, moikatai, and it's a present active tense verb means that it's continuous. It's a continuous verb. So if you marry somebody who left their spouse for, let's say, they had bad breath, and you get married to another, you are committing adultery and are continuing to commit adultery while you're with that person. Present active tense verb, adultery. Adultery. If you marry a person who was divorced because their a spouse was committing adultery, heterosexual sex, let's say they had an office affair, or they were they came out of the closet and they were sleeping with people of the same sex, that is not adultery, that's fornication. Look at it this way. All adultery is fornication, 100%, but only a small portion of fornication is adultery because fornication takes into account all sexual sins, all sinful sex, any kind of sinful sex with anything or anybody or whatever it is, internet, non-internet, physically, a different species, sex with aliens. It's all, it's all fornication, every bit of it. And it's all grounds in God's eyes for divorce. Then Jesus drops a major bomb on us in Matthew chapter 5. He said, you heard it was said of old time that you shall not commit adultery. That's in Exodus 20, right? That's one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, in the Old Testament, that was interpreted as having sex with somebody else's wife. And of course, that was a capital pun capital offense. But Jesus said, listen to this. He said, I say to you. Now, he, he himself personally is modifying the law of Moses. And you can see why everybody hated him so much. He was saying that my words modify the law of Moses. I am more important than Moses. I am changing or modifying or clarifying the law of God. I have that authority because I gave the law to Moses in the first place. So he says, I say to you, whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her in his heart. And of course, the flip side of that is same thing with females and males, you know. I say to you, whoever looks on a man to lust after him has committed adultery with him already in her heart, in his heart. So 
you see now that unlike the Old Testament, adultery has now been expanded to include iniquity in the heart. Think of it this way. The Greek words anomia, it means sin that you have in your heart that you haven't acted on. So a person could be a thief before they stole something. Okay? The reason they stole something is because they, they were a thief in their heart. Otherwise, they wouldn't have stolen anything. I am not a thief. I don't have any lust or desire to steal anything from anybody. You don't either. That means you are not a thief. What is a thief? It's a thief in your heart. An adulterer is a, is a person who has adultery in their heart. A murderer has murder in their heart. Then the sin is expressing the iniquity into a behavior. You're behaving in a certain way. You're spreading it by behaviors, sin, from iniquity, anomia, here in your heart. The sin has to be in here as iniquity before it's actually practiced as sin. Okay, so that's why there's no children in hell because kids are not capable of determining their world by conscience, by morality. If you tell a two-year-old, hey, stop knocking that glass off, you know, and they walk right over and knock it off again, well, that looks like sinful behavior, but it actually is not because the two-year-old is not capable of morally realizing that that's a sin to knock that off because your parents told you not to do it. They don't get it. So that, as Paul said in Romans, that sin is not imputed to that child so that when a child dies, they do not have any imputed sin to them because their conscience had not matured enough to morally know the difference between right and wrong. Babies, four-year-olds, they don't go to hell when they die. Okay? They, they go to heaven. Jesus said, my father's angels always behold them, children. And so you see here in the text, you have to interpret it the text in context. You can't just make stuff up. Now let's go back to this one again. It says, I say to you, whoever looks on a woman to lust after her. Flip side, whoever looks on a man to lust after him. That verse is not saying what it actually means. Blepon, to look, is also a present active tense verb. So that means you would have to be focusing on, concentrating on, desiring the other person to the point where you have lust in your heart. Epithumeo is the Greek word that means to set your passions upon. That is also in a present active tense verb. So you can see here that if you look at someone and you find them attractive, that is not a sin. Oh, look at him. Oh, he's so beautiful. Look at that body. Look at that face. That's not a sin if you just move on. But if you are constantly focusing on, fantasizing about, fantasizing about desiring, developing passion for that person in a sexual manner, that is, Jesus said, adultery, moikia, heterosexual sex. So my assumption is that it also applies to all forms of sex, homosexuality, lesbianism, you know, bestiality, pedophilia. The key to it is lusting in the heart. Okay? You are an adulterer in your heart first, and then the act of adultery is the sin of the iniquity in your heart. You have iniquity in your heart, and you express it in a sinful manner. That is sin. You're sinning. So here you can see why 
strip clubs, gentlemen's clubs, pornography is so dangerous because the person is lusting after and committing adultery or fornication with someone they don't even know or they've never even seen in person or someone they have never even touched. Jesus expanded adultery from sleeping with somebody's wife, Old Testament, to what you're doing in your heart. That's the same as actually committing the act. So if you're on porn and you are lusting after a certain actress or actor, that is the same as if you were in the porn video doing it in the eyes of God. God sees it the same. It's sin. It's sin. Okay, so let's take a couple of examples here. Uh, the most obvious one is Elizabeth Taylor, a very famous uh, female American actress. She was had superb acting, acting skills, very intelligent woman, drop-dead gorgeous, whole nine yards, Hollywood superstar, etc. She was married eight times. None of them were, were uh, Christian marriages, so to speak. But whether you're a Christian or a sinner, it doesn't matter. God honors marriage whether you're saved or unsaved. So when she was young, back in 1950, she married a guy named Conrad Hilton Jr., okay? And he was your typical, well, we would call the Hilton's billionaires back then, but they didn't have any billionaires. They were filthy rich, and this kid was your typical run-of-the-mill, spoiled rich kid. This kid was a spoiled brat. He was raised privileged. He was born with a silver spoon, not only stuck in his mouth, but everywhere else. And he had no responsibility, no maturity, no adulthood type behaviors. He was a party animal. He loved to party. The sex was great. And obviously, she was into the thing about a year or so and said, oh, my God. This guy is a psycho. I don't want to go into any details about the marriage. It doesn't mean, like, who cares? She got divorced. Okay, now that marriage was legal in the eyes of God because it was her first marriage. She had never been married before. And she left him and got divorced. Now, if she left him because he was cheating on her, then the divorce would have been legal in the eyes of God or he was committing fornication. Let's say he came out of the closet and he had a boyfriend. That's fornication. Let's say he was sleeping with his secretary. Oh, that's adultery. Doesn't matter. It was grounds for divorce, and she left. If she didn't divorce him because he was, was che wasn't was cheating on her for some other reason, and there were a lot of reasons with Conrad Hilton, the guy, the guy was a nut, then that is sin. She then married Michael Wilding in 1952. Okay. That didn't work out either. And in 1957, she married a guy named Mike Todd. Her life, uh, she was with him until he died. Um, that was her true love in life. That was the person she truly loved. He died on her. Then she got married again. She married Eddie Fisher. Then she got married again. Got divorced and got married to Richard Burton. Okay, and then she remarried Richard Burton. 1975. Then she uh, married a politician named John Warner. And then she divorced him. Then she went into drug rehab. Then she married a guy in drug rehab. Happens all the time. Larry Fertensky. Okay. So the point I'm trying to make here is that these marriages of hers, the first one was legal in the eyes of God, probably. But the rest of them were adultery. Again, um, adultery, muikia, is heterosexual sexual behavior. Male, female, female, male. And so she had all these marriages that were not legal in the eyes of God. She's dead now and in hell. But on Judgment Day, she's going to have to give account of all these marriages. 
She has to give an account of all these marriages. Let's take another sticky one. Uh, Paula and Randy White. Okay, so they both got married when they were unsaved. Then they got saved, became born again. Then they went in the ministry. All right, and then they got divorced. If they got divorced based on fornication or adultery, that was a legal divorce. If they got married for other reasons, it was not. All right, let's take another one. Eddie and Vanessa Long. He's dead now. She's still alive, I believe. They both got married when they were unsaved. Then they got saved. Then they went into the ministry. Then he committed fornication. He was bisexual. He was fooling around with young boys. She found out about that and got divorced. Okay, so that would be a legal divorce in the eyes of God if your husband or wife comes out of the closet and they're actually gay or lesbian or what have you, and you find out about it and you say, I'm out of here, that is legal in the eyes of God. That's how, how it works. Okay? Now, if you take a look at Brother Paul, he's talking to Christians, and they were having a lot of trouble in the Corinthian church because a lot of spouses had come to Christ, but their other, but their husband or wife had not come to Christ. They were struggling. Boy, is that a major problem in Christianity today. Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 7, quote, the wife is bound by the, the law as long as her husband is still alive, if her husband dies. She's at liberty to marry whom she will, but she is only allowed to marry another born-again Christian. It is a sin to marry a sinner. Okay? And I've done lots of marriage counseling over the years. I've been a counselor for 40 years. And uh, I have seen many Christians marry unsaved people, and the demons came to them and told them, oh, they'll get saved. You can win them to the Lord. Uh, they said that they want to go to church. They said they want to turn to Christ. And that is a setup. Okay, you're being played, sucked into a vortex. They are not going to do that, and it's going to be a living hell for years to come for you. So Paul said, don't let the demons talk you into marrying anybody who is not born again and has the Holy Spirit. For he said, quote, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, here he's technically talking about people who are not saved. For he says, what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? But in my counseling practice, I expanded the interpretation of that verse to include spirituality because it is extremely difficult to be married to someone who is not on your page, so to speak, spiritually. So if a Pentecostal marriages, marries a Congregationalist, you're looking at trouble you can't conceive nor believe in that relationship, right? If a Baptist marries a Charismatic, now you're looking at enormous trouble in that marriage. They're, they're, they're unequally yoked. They're not on the same page. It's not working. Okay, if you marry someone who is an agnostic or an atheist and you're a born again Christian, not on the same page, not, no, unequally yoked, unequally yoked. We'll always remember get somebody into marriage counseling before they get married and make sure the marriage is spiritually set because most marriages in the United States occur because someone loves the other person. Okay, love is not grounds to get married. You do not get married because you're in love only. Okay, there are spiritual ramifications to marriage. 
You cannot marry someone who you are unequally yoked with. Oh, Brother Mike, that's not true. Uh, my dad, my mom, my uncle, my, my aunt did this and that. That's true. God's mercy does catch some of this. But generally speaking, as a rule, generalized rule, do not marry anyone who is unequally yoked with someone who is not spiritually where you are, okay? For example, in, in my ministry, I have, a, a thank God, a large support staff of people who love the Lord and they love helping other people. I have a staff of counselors every week that, because they care about people and love the Lord, they are seeing people delivered and healed like you wouldn't believe. It's just amazing, some of these testimonies. Most of the people on my staff do not have spouses that support them. And constantly, the devil is attacking people on my ministry team through their spouses. It happens all the time. Now, that can't be helped because when they got married, they were in a certain condition. And then when they came into the hardcore Christianity ministry, they're now in this condition. That's perfectly normal. But the point I was illustrating was, if you're unequally yoked, there's nothing but trouble, lots of trouble, difficulties, challenges. You're, the other spouse who does not believe as you do, they will try to block you. Okay? So, for example, if you're currently engaged to someone who is an unbeliever, break the engagement. If you're currently living with a woman or a man, and you're intending to get married, but it's been three years now, and you just never got around to it. You've been living in adultery the entire time. End it. If you're currently living with an unsaved husband, now Paul mentions that specifically. So here's how he, what he recommended. If the unsaved spouse loves you or wants to stay in the relationship, you know, and you can work it out, you know, keep him, keep her. Because who knows, you may win the person to the Lord later. That was his recommendation. Uh, if you're currently dating an unbeliever, okay, stop it. Break it off. Uh, if you're currently looking for a spouse, stop doing that. Do not do that. The devil knows you're looking for a spouse, and he will send you one. And he will send you one that is going to give you sadness and grief for the rest of your life. It's going to be horrible. God picks out your spouse, not you, and that spouse is perfectly fit just for you. Fantastic. It is great. Boom. If you pick out the spouse, the probability is, not in every case, it's going to be a painful, heartbreaking, gut-wrenching disaster. Okay? If you're dating an unbeliever, break it off today. If you're looking for a spouse, stop doing it today. If you're having an office affair and uh, she or he said, hey, I'm leaving my spouse and you and you don't love your spouse anymore. So you guys are going to that is that is a recipe for total disaster. It's chronic adultery. Get out of it and run for it. OK. In the Old Testament, uh, your ex spouse uh, could not come back. If you're in the New Testament, you can rec reconcile with a previous spouse, your original husband or wife. You can reconcile with them, and you can you can go back and marry them. Okay. Now Jesus said in in. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, excuse me, Paul then explains it. Now, here's something very interesting. Whenever you have sexual relations with another person, gay, homosexual, heterosexual, pedophile, bestiality, it doesn't matter, any kind of sex. When you have any kind of sex with a human or animal, doesn't matter, aliens, doesn't matter, you will pick up well, what I call transfer spirits. 
That word is not in the Bible. I made it up to explain what's happening here. And here it is. Paul explains it. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Melos is the Greek word. It means body parts. You know, this is my body part. It's one finger. There's another one. Here's another one. There's one. Here's my hand. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's my hand. That's a body part of my body. Okay. Melos. This is a body part. Do you not know that your body parts, your whole bodies, are body parts of Christ? This is my whole body, Greek word soma. Shall I then take the members, melas, body parts of Christ and make them members or body parts, parts of a harlot? God forbid. Now, the Greek word for harlot there means porne, and it, was, it actually means a promiscuous woman. A pornas is a promiscuous man. But back 2,000 years ago in the Greek society, they used it to describe prostitutes, porne. But it actually means a promiscuous woman. That's a better definition. Then Paul says something shocking. I just mentioned it earlier. Flee fornication, pornea. Flee any type of sexual sin. Fugo means to run to run away from, bolt, Hussein bolted, flee fornication, for every sin a man does is without the body, ektos is the Greek word that means is comes from the exterior of the body. He that commits fornication, any form of sexual sin, pornea, sins against his own body, Greek word ice, it means sins into his own body into his body. You can sin into your body by picking up a transfer spirit during intercourse, during oral sex, during anal sex. A spirit transfers into your body. The same is true in the deliverance ministry. The same thing is true. The, the spirit transfers from the pedophile into the child. The abuser transfers a spirit into the child. It could be lust. It could be rejection. It could be different things. Right? And so this spirit that transfers into the person then starts to destroy that person's life. It starts to develop sinful urges. You start to develop similar emotional Issues the person that you fornicated with, such as anger, you know, lust, rage, bitterness, aggression, hate. You suddenly notice a change in your personality. If that happens, you can understand and know that you picked up a transfer spirit from that person you were dating, and that spirit is in your body. If that person you're dating has, has a, a family tree that has spiritual activity in it, such as witchcraft, masonry, uh, false religions, Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, some kind of super-powered spirits living in your family tree, that spirit could transfer into your body as well. And you could start developing some really severe spiritual and emotional symptoms because you slept with that person, you married that person, you had an affair with that person, you went to a party one night, you got drunk, and you experimented with your sexuality. You kind of made, you made out with another woman or another male. Transfer spirits. You're sinning into your body, 1 Corinthians 6.18. He that commits pornea, fornication, sins into his own body. Transfer spirits also occur during incest, during rape, group sex, open marriages, uh, adults fondling children, 
living on the DL. Prostitution. You went to a prostitute one time. You paid for oral sex. Transfer spirit. 100% of all prostitutes have demons. 100%. No exceptions. You fell in love with the office. You had an office affair. Transfer spirits. Yeah, you used to be a lesbian. You picked up all kinds of spirits from that. Homosexuality, polygamy, pornography. You went to a swingers club once. Yeah. All these kinds of things. Uh, you had an affair with a girl or a guy at church. And uh, you guys loved the Lord. You were serving the Lord. You fell in love. Both of you had lust demons. You went too far one night. You had intercourse. Transfer spirit. You can pick up a transfer. And it is extremely dangerous. Because if you pick up a transfer, you'll notice subtle personality changes in yourself. Emotional changes. Instability. Irritability. Anxiety. Panics. Panic attacks. Sex drive, going up or going down, high or low, it changes. You pick up a transfer spirit, your dream life. Uh, you might start having nightmares. You might start seeing shadow figures in your room. You're laying there in bed one night and you felt somebody sit on the end of the bed. You literally felt somebody sit there. You peek out over there, there's nobody there. You literally felt something pinning you down in bed and you couldn't move and you were having sleep paralysis. You tried to cry out for Jesus, but you couldn't get the words out. Um, you're laying in bed at night and somebody is fondling your genitals two o'clock in the morning. Or you're having a dream where you're having sex with somebody. You can't quite see their face. Or you wake up and you can sense there's a body or something hovering over you in bed. And you, or you just had a dream about strange sexuality, weird sex dreams that is against your character, against what you would normally do. Or you come up with uh, strange physical illnesses after you had an affair with somebody or slept with somebody or as soon as you pick up that trend, you may have picked up a transfer spirit of a spirit of uh, a nick uh, um, infirmity. If you picked up an infirmity spirit, your body starts having weird physical illnesses. And so this is what Paul was talking about. You're sinning into your own body. You're sinning into your own body. That's how it works. And Jesus was telling you that fornication and adultery are different terms. And that's what he was doing. He used different terms in these verses to explain to the scribes and Pharisees how sexual sin and human sexuality work. Yeah. So if you were a child, and uh, you got molested, you probably picked up a transfer spirit. It's usually the spirit of rejection. It's usually a spirit spouse sometimes. And uh, how can you tell if somebody has a spirit of spouse? Well, you follow the history of their life, their relationships, and you notice an a interesting pattern of breaks. Fall in love, break. Fall in love, break. Fall apart, break. Love, crash. You have this string of broken relationships behind the person. Okay? And uh, that's usually a sign of a spirit spouse. A spirit spouse is a superpowered lust demon. And usually, in your background or the person's background you fornicated with, there's usually some form of powerful spirituality, witchcraft, masonry, sorcery, stuff like that. Uh, in the background, that spirit spouse 
comes down through the tree and then transfers into you. And then that spouse takes possession of you as their spouse so that when you have a relationship, they always go bad or they always break up. Nothing ever seems to work out. And uh, it drives you crazy. It drives you crazy. Let me give you another quick example. Um, Benny Hinn and his wife got uh, married after they were both saved. And then they got divorced for irreconcilable differences. Well, that's a sin. Unless she or he had been caught in adultery or in fornication. If that wasn't the case, they got divorced. That was a sin. But neither of them got remarried. So neither other, other, neither of them were continuously sinning. Okay? They never got remarried. Now, if they had an affair or slept with somebody after they got divorced, obviously that's adultery. If it's with opposite sex or it's fornication, if it wasn't, doesn't matter. It's a sin. But later on, they reconciled. And then uh, Benny and Suzanne got remarried. And that is permissible in the New Testament. Reconciliation is permissible in the New Testament. I have seen personally uh, several marriages reconciled over the years, and I've saved several marriages through marriage counseling over the years, even though one or both were adulterers. If your spouse fornicates or commits adultery, that is not a requirement to divorce them. God was only saying it's an option to divorce them based on fornication. If you don't, if you love the person and you want to try and save the marriage, and you're going to look to the Lord to save it, hey, God performs miracles and can save your marriage. You're not required to divorce anybody. If you are divorced and you got remarried for all the wrong reasons and it was a sin, you can be forgiven because marriage is not the unpardonable sin when it includes divorce. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. There's only one unpardonable sin, and it's too hideous to even talk about. I'm not even going to mention it. There's one unpardonable sin. It is not divorce. So you have an opportunity to be forgiven. So you, let's say you uh, were not saved. You couldn't get along with your spouse. You got divorced. Then later on, you fell in love again. You, you got married, and then you got saved. You are not required to divorce that spouse and go back to the original spouse. The original spouse may have remarried or have been killed or committed suicide or is living in a foreign country. You're not required to do that. You don't do that. You stay with the spouse you have when you're married. Excuse me, when you're saved, you're married to that person. Then Paul explains to the Corinthians how to handle an unsaved spouse. God is not condemning you. Your sins are forgiven. See, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old, old things are passed away. All things become new. And God is telling you clearly that divorce is a forgivable sin. And I always share the same story. Many years ago, I came out of the Assemblies of God religion. And I used to work the altar for years at the Assemblies of God Church. And a woman came down. We were having a uh, charismatic service, and we were praying for people to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues. You know, that's what they do at the Assemblies of God and many other Pentecostal denominations. And um, a woman came down who I personally knew was divorced for the wrong reasons. I knew that person had married somebody else, and that was a sin. I knew all that was sin. I knew her. I knew her husband. And so I'm, at that time, I had this mentality that you're out of fellowship with God. You're, you're living with someone, and you're sinning. That's it, man. You're stuck. And to my utter amazement, uh, God showed me right to my face 
this gal got filled with the Holy Ghost at the altar that day, and she was crying and speaking in tongues. She was thrilled. And I'm sitting there going, what in the world? How did that happen? Well, I realized my theology was off. I didn't understand that divorce is a forgivable sin and that God God forgives you for that divorce. So, well, Brother Mike, somebody at church told me that I left my husband because of incompatibility and I married somebody else and then my husband moved to Russia or something. And he's remarried. And this pastor told me that I was still married to that first husband who's been remarried in Russia, so to speak. So I need to divorce my current husband, whom I love, and have two kids with, and go back go back to the Russian husband who's living in Moscow. Okay? No, you're not doing that. Stop that. Your divorce to the to the Russian guy was forgiven by God when you got washed in the blood of Christ, the living Christ. You were forgiven. And so there is therefore now no crema judgment to those who are in Christ Jesus. And you are not being condemned for something you did years ago where your spouse has remarried or joined a cult or only God knows what happened to that person. He, him, they, they, whatever the terminology you want to use, you do not divorce your current husband or wife and run back to a a spouse that is not available or is dead and stay single when you've already started a new life and got remarried and you have children and then you got born again. That is not a requirement of the gospel for you to do that. You do not do that. You are forgiven and there is no guilt or shame on you. Let's say, for example, you got married 10 times. You beat Elizabeth Taylor. You knocked her out right at the finish line. Boom, got her by two. Then you got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. What about that? Nothing. When you fell on your knees and got washed in the blood of Christ, you didn't have 10 divorces. What you have is mercy. You got God's grace upon your life. You are forgiven by God. There's no question. And so God is telling you, repent of carrying around guilt and regret over your prior marriages. You repented of them. You gave them to the Lord. Do not run out and divorce your current spouse and leave your children. Do not do that. You do not have to do that. Rejoice because you've been forgiven and God loves you and cares for you. If you have any questions, oh, we would love to answer them all for you. Mike at HardcoreChristianity.com. Mike at HardcoreChristianity.com. It doesn't matter whether you were married, divorced, living with someone, uh, living with a bunch of Mormons in northern Arizona. you got five wives. It doesn't matter. When you repent and come to Christ, those marriages are wiped out. God's mercy is upon you, and the grace of God has forgiven you. But Paul said again, if you're going to remarry, if you're going to get married, no, you can marry only marry someone who is born again Christian who has the Holy Spirit. That's the only person you can marry. You are not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers and marry someone who's an atheist or an agnostic and don't marry somebody who's an idiot or a moron. That's going to cause nothing but problems. But that's an aside recommendation from Brother Mike. That's not in the Bible. The Bible doesn't say thou shalt not marry a complete moron. That was something you chose to do, and that's some, that's another issue for another podcast. You can send me an email at mike at hardcorechristianity.com. Uh, please go to the website, if you would, and make a donation if you're interested. If you don't make a donation, we love you exactly the same. I do not take a salary in the ministry, neither does my wife. All my 
ministry activities are what we call volunteering. We're volunteering. Right? So I can't uh, ask somebody to do I'm not something that I'm not willing to do. And I did. I donated my entire salary to the ministry. And so if you donate money to us, we are grateful. If you cannot donate any money to us, we are grateful for you. Money is not the most important thing. The Holy Ghost and the Word of God is the most important thing. If you know someone that can't come to Arizona and needs deliverance or healing, and it's a chronic condition, not a problem. Send me an email, and I will send you the miracle list, a step-by-step -step guide to deliverance and healing. It works 100% of the time in everyone that does it. It works 0% of the time in people who do not do it. Okay? But it works 100% 100 of the time for those who do it, the miracle list. I have it in four languages, and uh, it's ready to go. I'll mail it out today if you send me an email. Not a problem. Please remember I'm on this podcast every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock Pacific time, 9 o'clock a.m. Arizona time, and uh, noon Eastern, obviously. And so please join me every Sunday morning on the deep things of God. I will be bringing uh, material to you that you cannot hear in church. In other words, if you go to a church and you get teachings, good for you, keep going. Got Sunday school teachings, great, keep doing it. None of the stuff on this podcast you will ever hear in a church, okay? I'm bringing the deep things of God, not the regular teachings you hear at church, okay? That's what we do here. We go for the deep stuff and not the stuff that you would normally hear, the common things that are, at, are taught, okay? I'm teaching the deep things of the word, and I want to share them with you, and I'm grateful to do it. Yeah? This is Brother Mike signing off. May God richly bless you.